All right, watch your footing. This is really slippery. Oh, cool. Check this out. We got a little cove. This could be a perfect spot to find creatures. Come on up. Ooh, it's slippery. You good? Yeah, watch your footing. Perfect. All right, just going down in the... Oh, there's an eel. Nice. No, it's a sea snake. Where? Right there, right there, right there. Yeah. Got it. Look at that. There's no question about it. This is the most lethal snake species I have ever handled. As the tide recedes on the Pacific edge of Costa Rica, our journey beyond the tide begins. Climbing over the washed up skeletons of trees, my feet hit the water and splash through the shallow remains of the ocean. My eyes keenly locked into every shadowy pool and my mind racing with excitement at the thought of the creatures I may stumble upon. You never know what you will find in a tide pool and that is what makes them a mystery. Today we're exploring Mogo's Beach located on the Gulf of Dulce on the Osa Peninsula. Okay, we have now landed on Mogo's Beach. Let's head up the shoreline here and see what sort of cool creatures we can find. This remote location can only be reached by boat and is very rarely explored by humans. However, we have been given special permission to walk its shoreline where we will search for tide pool residents. Coyote, so you want to tell us what's going on with this net? Yeah, I guess you guys aren't used to seeing me work with a net. And that's because in an ocean tide pool, you never know what you're going to come across. And some of these little creatures could be poisonous or venomous. And if you have to catch something really quick, it's easier to scoop it up with a net, get it in a controlled situation to analyze it, determine what it is before you actually get hands on. Worst thing that you can possibly do is get bitten or stung by something that can kill you. The crystal clear waters were swimming with fish, and the surrounding rocks were crawling with hermit crabs. Right away we were seeing all sorts of creatures, including a baby puffer fish. Look at that, I've just got him cupped in my hand right now, can you see that? Yeah. Look at his little fins going. And one slippery little octopus. That is so creepy feeling. Tide pools are the perfect place to come across small ocean animals that have become stranded when the tide goes out. However, Navigating the remaining slippery rocks as a human is rather difficult. Well, this beach sure is making it difficult. This terrain is full of all kinds of these huge rocks. It's what I call an ankle breaker right there. Let's keep moving up this direction and hopefully come across some terrain. It's a little bit easier to navigate. As we made our way north along the craggy terrain, we went up and over a large rock formation. This is where we encountered one of the rarest animals you will ever find in a tide pool. Watch your footing, this is really slippery. Oh cool, check this out, we got a little cove. This could be a perfect spot to find creatures. Come on up. Oh, it's slippery. You good? Yeah, watch your footing. Oh, thank you. All right, just going down in there. Oh, there's an eel! Where? Right there, right there, right there! Ah, I got it! Nice. No, it's a sea snake! Yeah. Got it, look at that! Woo! Dude, oh, oh you all right? Jeez, okay. yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. Whoa. Obviously, it's pretty slippery, but look at that! Whoa. Holy cow! That is a yellow-bellied sea snake. All right, be careful because they are incredibly venomous. Hold on, let me get him out of the net. Oh, well, careful. Okay, I got him. Nice. Come here, buddy. Wow. Whoa. Okay, 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 good. Oh, 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 he's trying to bite me. All right, I got him. There we go. Wow! Look at that! I see all those little tiny teeth in there. This snake is incredibly venomous, so I need to be as careful as possible. And wow, it feels like a fishing lure. How cool is that? These guys are usually far out at sea. He was just in this little cove here. Must have gotten stuck when the tide was going out. All right, let's take him back up over the top of the rocks here onto the beach and get a closer look. Oh man, this nice. is so cool. I cannot believe you caught that sea snake. Woo! All right, watch your foot and head back here. Let's go up here onto the sand. Check this out. That is the yellow phase of the yellow-bellied sea snake. Hold on, I gotta get him out of there. Come here, buddy. 
Now normally you wouldn't find a snake like this so close to shore. I'm suspecting that because it's low tide right now, he got marooned in that tide pool. Normally you'd find them about two to 300 yards out into the ocean. I have never held a sea snake before. This is so cool. Now you'll notice the shape of this snake's body is very flattened. Can you see that? And the tail almost looks like an oar. This allows them to easily move through the water. If I were to just put this snake down on the shore right here, they are not adapted to land. He would kind of just lay there and uh, be like, eh, I'm a dead snake. But out in the ocean, this guy is quick and stealthy. Now they are not aggressive, but I can't take my attention away from my fingers being gently positioned behind its neck here. One bite from this snake with as far away as we are from civilization, and I would be in some serious trouble. What would happen to you? Uh, I could potentially die, depending on how my body reacted. There's no question about it, this is the most lethal snake species I have ever handled. Now, these snakes are piscivores, which means that they hunt for fish. They have an incredibly potent neurotoxin. All it needs to do is tag a fish with the small fixed fangs inside of its mouth, and immediately the fish becomes paralyzed, and then the snake is capable of having its meal. Now one interesting fact that you may not know is that the sea snake has an incredibly large lung that runs along the left side of its body. This allows these snakes to hold their breath for a long time when they're underwater hunting. It also works like the bladder of a submarine, allowing these snakes to become buoyant and they will float all the way up to the surface. Finding a sea snake near shore is incredibly rare, and this one was likely stranded. So we decided to release it further out in the ocean to ensure that it found a safe return to the wild. Well, how epic was that? Getting up close with the yellow belly sea snake on our first episode of Beyond the Tide. These reptiles are a fragile part of the ecosystem that can be greatly affected by changing weather patterns. To swim alongside one in its natural environment was incredible, and I hope their species will continue to thrive beneath the ocean's surface so that future animal enthusiasts like myself can appreciate just how beautiful these snakes truly are. Today we're headed out on a snake scavenger hunt. I'll be working alongside my friend and wildlife biologist, Will Robertson. Say hi, Will. Hi, Will. This region is known for its plethora of species. We're gonna be scouring the fields, searching the forests, flipping rocks, and rolling logs, doing whatever it takes to find some of these cool reptiles. Will, are you ready? Let's find some snakes. Ehoo! Ehoo! Ugh, pollen. Oh, snake. I think it was a garter snake. He went down into this little hole right here. Oh, yeah, there's his little face. He's right there. Let's see if I can tickle him out. There he is. Gotcha. Whoa, there we go. All right, let's take a look at this one. So that is the eastern garter snake. One of the coolest things most people don't realize about garter snakes is that they are mildly venomous. Not a venom that could ever hurt a human, but for the most part, these are super calm, super docile snakes. You can see that little defense mechanism right there totally flattening out the body and almost making the head look as if it's V-shaped, which of course would be indicative of a venomous snake, but as we know, the garter snake is completely harmless. This is cool, it's like a river of moss. Look at that. Now normally, you probably have water flowing down through this spillway and towards this lake that we're getting toward, but it's just a really unique looking habitat, almost like Lord of the Rings. And it seems as if the lake might pay off because Will just said he's got a big water snake basking. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. These guys are non-venomous, but they do bite quite a bit. So we'll see what this guy does. All right, Will's got the water snake. Oh yeah, beautiful. And definitely a species that people oftentimes think is venomous, but completely harmless. The northern water snake. That's another one for the list, Will. Yeah, there we go. Looking good. Oh, coyote, sanitize real quick. Don't want to spread those snake fungal diseases. Oh, red-bellied snake. Oh, red-bellied snake. Pretty basic looking snake, except for the fact that it has a pretty vibrant red belly. Let's flip it. Oh, a little vole. Look at his little tunnel. 
Hi, buddy. Got an interesting little precarious scenario here. There is a rock ledge that a black racer is up on. I think if I drop myself down into this little hole, I might be able to come around the edge and get it. I see it, but it does not see me. It's right there. Definitely right on the edge of this cliff. Got it. <sighs> Getting under control is gonna be a whole nother story. And these snakes are really bitey. Oh, geez. That is one angry black racer. Will, got a black racer for the snake scavenger hunt. Oh. Let's see if we can do this without taking a bite. There we go. Okay. Focus is on the camera at the moment. And there we have it. Another species for the snake scavenger hunt. All right, Mario, I'm gonna bring it up for the tight shot. That is the black racer. Looks like it's getting ready to shed its skin. You can tell that from the cloudiness in the eyes. And the thing that I love most about this species is its agility and its speed. Not to mention the coloration is very similar to the black mamba. But of course, this is a non-venomous species. So a bite is gonna be nothing more than a little soap and water to clean up. All right, watch how fast the snake is when I let it back into the environment. <laughs> or not. That's kind of cool just to get it in that, that display mode. I thought you were just gonna speed off, but instead you're giving us some incredible B-roll. Nothing wrong with that. Ooh, look at that. Big ringneck snake. That's a nice orange belly. So these guys spend most of their time underground looking for things like salamanders to eat. They're very tame snakes. They have never bite. You can see they have tiny, tiny little heads with a prominent yellow ring right around the neck. Double flip. No. But here? Nope. Guess who found a hog nose snake? Right here, Will. Oh, it's on the move. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I'll grab him up here. Okay. Whoa. Wow. A That's hog nose a... snake for the scavenger hunt. This is a difficult one to find. And look at that pointed nose right there. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. You know what happens when they poop, right? Yeah, these guys are known for playing dead. Oh my gosh, the smell is unbearable. Wow. Dude, you are covered in poop. Let's wipe that off. Oh my oh. gosh. Ugh. Hands. When lifting rocks... <coughs> <coughs> Swallow the bug. <coughs> <coughs> I was gonna try to tell you about rock etiquette. <coughs> Back to one. When lifting rocks, it's important to have good rock etiquette, which means you lift a rock gently and you place it right back exactly where you found it. Ants. Whoa. Do they bite or sting? Let's find out. They don't really do anything. They run away. <laughs> Not a sting episode. Will just called out to me that he found an abandoned car that I need to check out. I don't know what an abandoned car would be doing out here on the side of this mountain. Like, how did it even end up here? Wow, that is, what? I would not be surprised if rattlesnakes were using this old rusted car. That's really interesting. I mean, how did this get around? here? They must have rolled it down the hill and crashed it. It'd be really creepy if we found a body in it. Not that I can see, just some uh, bush light. Yeah. Don't trick and drive. Yeah, that's a good message. Let's see if we can lift this hood. Yeah, give it a flipperoo. <sighs> Don't see any rattlesnakes. No. Worth a check though. Oh, this is tired. Did it spin? Yeah, no. rest in place. Oh, Creepy. There's a rat snake on top. Oh my gosh, there Check is. It out. Oh my goodness. In the abandoned car. <laughs> a new species. Oh, 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 new oh, one. Ow. New one. All right, what do you need me to do? Oh, like, hold on. I might be able to. Here, here, here. Let me get a little tangled in the engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, there, we there we go. Whoa. New species. Whoa. Careful, careful. Yes. Whoa. How about that? <laughs> All right, Will, what do we got? We've got a black rat snake, and this is actually a small one. 
despite being a pretty decent sized snake, these guys are the largest snakes around here. They can get almost eight feet long. They eat birds and they climb right up trees to nab squirrels. This guy's in shed, so his eyes are pretty blue. Unbelievable. Awesome. What would you say is the holy grail of snake species in this area? I would say the green snake. They're bright, bright green. They look like nothing else from around here. They're super tropical looking. You never believe that they're right here in the Appalachians. When it comes to garter snakes, we found the mother load. A whole pile of sunning snakies right there. These rocks are alive with snakes. This is perfect conditions at the moment to find a number. Whoa, jeez, huge water snake. Really, really big northern water snake. All right, here, let's, yeah. Uh, let's, yeah, I'm gonna need uh, at least you to hold the, hold the camera. Okay. Wow, that's a big one. Hopefully it does not decide to give me a chomp. This is good size, wow. Oh, they got a green over there. They got a green. What? They got a green over there. Man, ow! Oh, okay, we're coming, we're coming. Oh! Beautiful. Amazing. And that's one of the rare ones for around here. I was walking and sure enough, just saw a little movement and reached down and got the little green snake. Amazing. Beautiful. That is the holy grail. Uh, wow, okay, well, all in one two minute clip. Huge northern water snake and a smooth green snake. Here, let me give you this. All right, let me see this guy. Oh my goodness. Wow. The smooth green snake. That is the ultimate right there. Look at that. Big snake, little snake. Cute snake, seemingly dangerous snake, but both completely harmless. No way. Mario just got another green snake. How big is this one? Oh my gosh. It's even tinier. Oh my goodness. Look at that little guy. Wow. Oh, that is gorgeous little green snake. Well, we did it. Two beautiful smooth green snakes. Now, what's your favorite thing about this reptile? It's got to be the vibrance, hands down. I mean, it's a bright green snake. It looks like it came from the jungle, but here we are in the Appalachians and we've got it. So this is one of my favorite snake species as a kid. I used to always see them in my backyard, but they're becoming more and more scarce. And what is the reason for that? Well, you know, along with habitat destruction, when people spray pesticides on their lawn, these guys eat insects. So if they eat insects that have pesticides on them, well, you know what happens. It's gonna wipe out the snakes. So less pesticides means more smooth green snakes. Will, an enormous thanks to you for taking us out today in some of your favorite herping spots. This was the ultimate snake scavenger hunt. Make sure to check out Will's YouTube channel. Lots of awesome videos there. And until we collaborate on the next one, I'm Coyote Peterson. I'm Will Robertson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, smooth green snakes, back into the grass. There's an old saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. When it comes to featuring the elusive timber rattlesnake, this saying seems to be our team motto. Oh my gosh, the terrain that we traverse looking for rattlesnakes is a challenge unlike anything we've really ever done before. And this is our third venture out looking for timbers and it never gets any easier. As the sun is really beating down on us, you can see all this distance down behind me. These mountainsides are what we essentially scale, looking for these perfect clusters of rocks where the snakes will be out and sunning. It takes a toll on your body, that's for sure. I'm gonna catch up to Tim and Mario. This hike is definitely testing our will to find these snakes. Today we have gained special permissions to explore what is known as a right-of-way that was built several years ago during the insertion of a natural gas pipeline. Upon initial installment, this type of construction would have had an adverse impact on the local wildlife. Yet beyond construction, it has become an ideal habitat for many species. Insanely steep, brush covered and strewn with a jumble of various rock sizes, this is now the perfect safe haven for our sought after target, the timber rattlesnake. Wow. I mean, we're always talking about how beautiful West Virginia is, but when you make it to the top 
of a bluff like this, check out the view. That is something. My goodness. Wild and wonderful West Virginia right there. Endless miles of possible snake territory. But are we gonna find one? That's the real question. Once again, we have teamed up with wildlife expert, Tim Brust. You likely recognize Tim from a variety of episodes on the Brave Wilderness channel, but it's truly the timber rattlesnake that we can define as his specialty. Currently, Tim has been conserving these snakes by mitigating human-snake interactions. Simply put, he explores the areas that are about to go into construction, finds, and safely moves these reptiles from the path of bulldozers. During this process, he also educates field crews about these misunderstood animals, which helps to keep the snakes alive and the humans safe from having an unwanted venomous encounter. We are going down at a pretty considerable angle right now in our search for timber rattlesnakes. Now, a lot of this environment has this crumbled flat rock, right? All of this, this almost like sheet rock. So we're lifting up these giant pieces of rock and looking beneath them for snakes. You hear that? It is completely hollow underneath this rock and it's very big, which means there's no chance of flipping it. But I came down and I scouted this after walking over it and look at this. That right there is an absolute perfect spot for a timber rattlesnake to be hiding. Now you would never want to stick your hand up and underneath a rock like that to sift through the leaves. A bite from a timber rattlesnake could definitely kill you. It's just a matter of covering ground and searching, searching, searching. The more ground we cover, the better the chances we have of finding a snake. The Western Hemisphere is home to 32 different rattlesnake species. And in my opinion, the timber rattler is one of the most iconic. We have been trying for years to share this species with you. But today, things are about to change. So Tim and Mario are ahead of me. They just call out, they found a timber rattlesnake. Making my way as fast as I can down this rocky slope. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, this is it. We've got a timber rattlesnake. Yes! Oh my gosh, that snake is beautiful. Okay, it sounds like we've got two snakes. So what we're doing is just bagging the snake for the moment to see if we can get the bigger one. Got a really big snake, really big snake. All right, what do you need me to do, Tim? Whoa, holy mackerel, that is a huge snake. We, it's, it, we can't. We can't. Here, hold the tongs here. You got him? Yep. Watch out. Here's the head body here. Be really careful, there's other snakes in the area. So what's happening right now is we've got a very big snake underneath this rock. It's a There's very a dangerous situation. You can see how steep it is right here, so we've got to be very careful. There are also other snakes within the rock, so we're going to slowly peel back pieces of these rocks and see if we can safely get this snake. Check it out. There are sheds of snake skin all over the place. We have found a hot spot. It's been quite the hike to get to this spot, but we have finally got a timber rattlesnake. Several of them out here. The other one? It's a big snake. Oh my God. Hold him, hold him, hold him. Wow, that is a huge rattlesnake. Okay, do we have another bag with us? Yep. Okay. In total, we were able to secure three snakes, one of which appeared to be a gravid female. This is incredibly exciting for the future of this population. Beautiful. And to ensure she does not get stressed, we immediately release her back into the rock. Don't want to get any closer than that. How about that, Mario? We finally got our timber. <laughs> we got multiple timbers. Oh my gosh. That is a good sized snake. All right, so what we're gonna do is actually put the snake in a snake bag at the moment. It is definitely a big snake, but we can't film right here. We have to take it to a slightly more controlled setting. So we're gonna safely bag it, move it, and then bring it back down here for the release. When you're bagging a snake, you always want to secure it at the back side of the bag with the snake hook. Snake skin. That means this is a healthy population of rattlesnakes that hang out in this area here. We've hit the rattlesnake mother load, that's for sure. <laughs> With the two other snakes contained, we begin the arduous climb back up the steep sides of the right-of-way. 
This is a very slow and very delicate process. Mario, are you doing okay? Actually, I tell you what, it's really hard on the forearm. You gotta keep the snake well away from your body so it doesn't swing on you. Snakes can bite easily through the bags. And most people are venomated when they're transporting snakes like this, so you have to be very careful. There's the snakes. That's where we came from. And that is where we're still going. A lot of effort, but totally worth it. There it is, the timber rattlesnake. This is our third attempt at finding one of these reptiles in the wild, and my goodness, is this one handsome. Now, the name timber rattlesnake comes from the fact that you find these snakes in forested areas, and they are cryptic. Unless you know exactly what it is that you're looking for, your odds of seeing one are rather pretty slim. Unless you stumble upon it and it gives you that warning of its rattle, you may walk right past it. Now, as compared to the other rattlesnake species here in the United States, I'd actually consider this species rather docile. Their defense is always going to be to rely on their camouflage first. If you get too close, this is exactly what you're going to hear. That rattle going into full action. Basically a security system that says, you're too close, get any closer, and you may take a bite. You can see how close I am to the snake right now, just about a foot and a half from it. I don't wanna make any sudden movements and provoke it too striking, but it definitely senses that I'm here. And the rattlesnake is the pinnacle of snake evolution. What I want you guys to really take a look at are the heat sensing pits right in front of the eye and right below the nostril that allow these snakes to pick up the heat signatures of their prey. Basically, all they need to do is lay in wait as an ambush predator for something to come close. Their tongue will flick out, they will sense the chemicals, the smell of that prey item, and then with those heat sensing pits, they can hone in almost like a heat seeking missile and then strike out with those hinged fangs. Remember, the fangs are like hypodermic needles and the second they inject that venom, that prey item has pretty much no chance of surviving. Now, if it's something like a small rabbit or a rat, a chipmunk, a squirrel, and it runs off, the snake will actually follow the scent of that prey item until it succumbs to the venom, and then it's capable of swallowing down its meal. And those fangs work individually of one another, and they will almost use those like grappling hooks to drag their prey backwards into their mouths. Now, the fangs are modified teeth, but all snakes have multiple rows of teeth within their mouth that are constantly being replaced throughout the course of the snake's life. So as the fangs draw the prey in, the other teeth work it back down the throat and they swallow their prey whole. Now, as compared to other rattlesnake species in the United States, I would say the timber rattlesnake is more ambush than it is nomadic. They will always lay in wait, waiting for their prey to come to them. Any small mammals or small amphibians that they come across within the forested environment make perfect prey. And a snake of this size, which measures, I would guess, just a little over three feet in length, is considered a full-grown adult. You may be saying to yourselves, Coyote, you guys are so good at being able to come across animals. How come it's taking you so many attempts to find the timber rattlesnake? This species specifically has been persecuted beyond what other rattlesnakes have even faced. A lot of times people will come across the den, which is known as a hibernaculum. Once they see this, a huge collection of snakes, what they will do is sometimes dump concrete or gasoline and burn these snakes or bury them alive. So you can wipe out an entire population of snakes by doing something like that. So seeing one of these snakes, actually several of them like this in the wild in a very difficult to reach spot is a very positive thing. It means that the population is thriving. Nothing makes us more excited than to see a thriving population of timber rattlesnakes. Oh, this is just such a cool reptile. Now the next most important thing that we need to do is actually collect the biometrics of this snake. And to do that, what we're gonna do is gently get it into a snake tube. This will put the least amount of stress on the snake and will be the safest scenario for both myself, Tim, and the crew to be able to handle the snake. What I also wanna do is get a more up close look at that rattle. Because when it comes to rattlesnakes, nothing is more impressive than that defense system. All right, snake is on the move. All right, Tim, so what would you like me to do to help with this part of the procedure? And these guys, you want to gently direct their head into the tube. Got it. 
So when he goes in, just set the tube at an angle if you can downward. Okay. Sometimes it takes 30 seconds, sometimes it takes 20 minutes. Grab, 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 grab now. Quick, quick, quick. I'm pushing them. Push them up. There you go. Two on the tube, two on the snake. Woo! That was not easy. Wow, that is a powerful snake. My goodness. With the snake safely tubed, Tim and I are able to quickly collect the biometrics, which include the snake's total length, scale count below the cloaca to determine the reptile's sex, and finally, a rattle button count. This doesn't tell us anything specifically scientific, it's just cool to compare rattle sizes. That rattle is one of the most unique aspects of this snake. And the rattle itself is actually made out of modified scales. You can actually see the way that it's growing out of the tip of the rattlesnake's tail itself. Now inside its tail are a bunch of very specialized muscles that allow the tail to vibrate at a very high rate, which causes the rattle to actually rattle. So I can rattle it myself like that, or if I let go of those muscles, the rattlesnake will rattle it on its own. Now the rattle is made out of something known as keratin, the same material that the scales are made out of and the same thing that your hair and your fingernails are made out of. People always wanna know, well, what's inside the rattle of a rattlesnake? Truth be told, nothing at all. They're actually interlocking segments that are hollow. They're known as buttons, and when they vibrate against each other, that is where you get the rattling sound. Now, you cannot tell the age of a rattlesnake by the number of buttons. People often think that like the rings of a tree, if you count those buttons, you can tell how old the snake is. That is not true, because throughout the course of the snake's life, it can lose segments of its rattle. But a new button comes into place every single time this snake sheds its skin. Now, this snake here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 buttons on that rattle. Honestly, this is the largest rattle I've ever seen on any of the rattlesnakes we have featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. Truly a unique aspect of this snake's evolution that makes it so incredibly distinct as compared to any other snake around the world. Well, how cool is this? Spending an unbelievable amount of time searching for and finally finding the timber rattlesnake. Together, Tim and I worked out of scene to collect biometrics on the other big snake. It was robust and as healthy as a rattlesnake could be, which was a great sign for this thriving population. No two snakes are ever the same, and considering the timber rattler comes in such a wide variety of color faces, it's pretty cool to see just how different individuals are, especially when compared side by side. Finally, we hiked back down to the point of discovery and released both snakes into their corresponding rock crevices. The future of rattlesnakes, and all snakes for that matter, is always tangled up in a series of uncertainties that center around an unnecessary fear of these misunderstood reptiles. Yet it's conservationists like Tim Brust and the tireless work he does to help people understand the importance of these creatures that will ensure they continue to slither across the planet. What do you got? Okay, well, uh, the homeowners, they, they don't want to be filmed, so they're just going to stay inside and probably watch us from the windows. Okay. Uh, but they said, have at it. Said the snake was somewhere over here. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all we got going for us, uh, but they're more than happy to have us here searching, so let's go look. Okay, great. Okay, so what I say we do is split up. Uh, okay. Which direction you want to go? I want to go that way first. Okay, I'll go that way. If you see something, call it out. We'll all converge together. And with any luck, we're going to catch and relocate a snake. All right, let's get a snake. Here we go. So my reasoning for going in this direction is because this is a star apple tree. Check that out. Very fragrant fruit. All this fruit needs to be eaten by something. So what happens is rodents and other species will come to eat the fallen fruit, and maybe there might be snakes in ambush waiting for them. And believe it or not, sometimes looking up underneath vehicles is a great place to look because they provide shade and shelter, especially if a car hasn't moved in quite some time. Let me do this. There's a big snake. Ugh. 
I'd easily be able to see if it was hiding up underneath the vehicle like this. Most snakes are nocturnal. So now that it's daytime, the snake is likely gonna be hunkered down somewhere. So the next step is to find things to flip. Uh, debris, tin, wood, anything that a snake can hide underneath. And hopefully there is something underneath. Oh man, look at this. I thought this was snake skin. Snakes are potentially arboreal out here. We have tree boas out here. We have lots of different um, parrot snakes, vine snakes. So it is always a good idea to look up in the rafters to see if there's anything. Look at this. That right there could be a possible entry point, likely for rodents, also accessible for snakes. Whoa, that's actually some water. Yeah, if I was a snake hiding during the day, this would, I just heard something. Oh, there's all kinds of tap holes. Water down in here. Oh, what would have been amazing is if I walked into this abandoned swimming pool and just found a snake curled right up in the water. I was thinking that that might be it. This looks pretty good. We got a uh, I don't know, chicken coop or actually it's a thing full of wood. Lots of spaces for snakes to hide in. Boa, holy smokes. I did not even see it there. Holy smokes. Coyote! Yeah, we got a snake. You got a snake? And Mario just called, he's got a snake. Oh my gosh. Is it big? Holy cow, that is a big snake. Oh my gosh. Dude. It is a boa constrictor. Dude, I, I came around here I didn't even see that the snake was right there. Oh my gosh. Okay, we found the snake. It's big. They weren't kidding. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this camera. Let's regroup ourselves. Uh, That's a big snake. Dude. Big snake. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is a huge boa constrictor. Okay, so this is it. The moment we're going to engage with the snake and try to safely get it out of this box of logs. Mm -hmm. No idea how it's going to behave. That's a hiss. Oh, and there we go. Whoa. Now the snake's in a position where there's no way I can make a reach for it. You can see it's completely in a defensive strike position and getting my hand any closer than this could mean getting my fingers entrapped. And look at all these incredibly huge razor sharp teeth. That is intimidating. Good, 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 good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Try to get a hold of that another snake. Whoa! That was close. Okay, cool. Snake is, yep, bring is him out. out. Bring him out. Bring him out. That's good. Don't let it go back in. There you go. 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 That's me. Unbelievable. That snake is all of five, maybe six feet in length. Look so, at the nub tail. tail. It is. Wow. Check this out. Now, if I come on this side of the snake, you can really get an idea for just how big it is. Now, a boa is a non-venomous species, so I don't have to worry about taking a bite and being envenomated, but these snakes have a mouth full of teeth. They're actually like little razor blades turned backwards. And on the top of the skull, they have multiple rows of teeth. So when they grab onto their prey, it locks in place. And the skull's capable of expanding, and these snakes can swallow down prey that are many times larger than their own bodies. And this is what you would consider a full-grown female boa. 
that aggressive hissing is basically just saying, I'm a big snake, I'm intimidating, you don't want to get any closer. There we go. Turn the coils like that. Yeah, we have to keep her as straight as possible. Okay. Now it's important to keep the snake stretched out, otherwise it's going to completely constrict around me. Okay, I got you. I got you. The snake is extremely strong, and I'm being as gentle as I possibly can. Okay, I'm gonna actually, if I shift my hand back just a tiny bit there. Oh wow, she's got ticks all over her. Um, I'm gonna use my multi-tool to pull them off. She's got a big one right on the side of her head here. Not this isn't gonna hurt at all. Oh, look at that, completely full of blood. That parasite is a really unhealthy thing for a snake like this. Right now we're kind of just doing a little bit of a uh, service by hopefully getting rid of some, some ticks, but otherwise she would be fine with these uh, as is. As you can see, the coils around my leg, the snake has to feel comfortable. Once you engage the head, the snake has to be in defensive mode. That's when the snake is gonna be at its most aggressive. I do have to be aware of where those teeth are at at all points in time. The less pressure I put on her, the less constrained she feels. Oh, yeah, you're getting constricted. That's a... We wanna keep those coils spread out as much as we possibly can. Here's another tick. I'm okay. full of ticks right now. I've gotten all the ticks off the top third of the snake. She looks pretty good. You want to stretch her out a little bit so that we can see the, the full length? There we go. That's pretty cool. That is a beautiful snake. Gorgeous. Well, uh, the good news for this boa is that because we were able to find it and safely catch it, we're now going to be able to relocate it to a much wilder area. All this human habitation, while it may provide good opportunities for this snake to get a meal, it actually puts it in the way of danger. I'm actually really thankful that these property owners said, hey, do you guys wanna come safely remove the snake? Because killing an animal like this is actually really detrimental to the environment. These snakes do an incredible amount of good by helping to balance the pest populations. Well, I'd say this was a success. We found the snake, and now we're going to be able to safely relocate it back out into the wild. It's been a rainy morning, but we've got a call. Lockie, where are we headed? We're headed out to the back of the Sunshine Coast hinterland to a house where we've just got a call. They've seen a fairly large snake inside the house. Um, it's generally a pretty good area for brown snakes, this one, so very, very likely could be a big brown snake. Okay, if we're finding the eastern brown snake, we're talking about the second most venomous snake in the world. Exactly right. So this is by far the most dangerous snake. The reason for that, they live around people. They are responsible for the vast majority of deaths in this country each year. What is it that you instructed the people at the house to do in this situation? So generally, the best thing that we ask people to do is to contain the snake. Uh -huh. If they close the doors, uh, they put a towel underneath the door so the, the snake can't get from one room to the next. We have an idea of where the snake's gonna be. We know it's still there and we can stay there until we find it. This is it. All right, so what's the typical protocol? Um, grab the gear, get in there, find out where they saw it last. Okay. And let's go for it. Here we go. Before it moves. Okay. We've got your tubes. I'll take this as well. Okay. Back up. All right, let's do it. Knock, knock. Where'd you see it? Down the hall, put the tail in front of the door. Perfect. All right, pretty tight in here. Yeah. We'll go in, we'll try and find it, and then let's try and restrain it once we get out here in a little more open space. The great thing is that we know which room supposedly it's in. Just check this before we go back past it. Okay. We don't want to go past the room and then have it pop out behind us. Yeah, that's a good call. So this is the perfect thing that we want people to do. Mm -hmm. Now at least we've got a good idea that it's probably in this room. Good. Okay. Yep. All right, go for it. You can already see a few things have been knocked down by the looks of it. Look at how this is sitting up. Oh, yeah, I can see it moving. You see it moving? Oh, do you think it's moving? It's, it's moving. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, under yeah. the carpet. Oh, there's definitely there's something under there. All right, what do you reckon? Should we go for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, this is sweating. This is really tight quarters. Oh, what's it gonna be? What's under the rug? It's a brown snake. Oh, it's a brown snake. It's a brown snake. Here we come. Oh, look at, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go for it, shall we? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna pull this back quickly. Okay. And then 
we'll see what we've got. Nope, oh, there yeah. it is. You can see he's already very much onto us. He's pretty wired. He's going, we're going to go for it. He's hooked around this, I'm gonna. All right, I'm just gonna back my way out. You okay. out of the way. Whoa. He's pretty good. You got some tubes? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I'd say get it up against the wall there. I'll try and walk him along the wall straight into the tube. I think that'll suit well. Right into that corner. Alright, Kylie, grab, grab. Yep. Okay. Well done. Well done. You got him? Yep. I got him. Beautiful. Okay. Alright. Oh. Great job. Woo! <sighs> Tight spaces and browns. Nicely space. done. Holy mackerel. Okay, let's uh let's move to this back porch here. Got a little bit better lighting and uh we'll take a better look at this eastern brown. What a catch! Anytime you hold on to a snake that is this venomous, you just have to stop and remind yourself that you're essentially holding on to a loaded gun. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Eastern Brown, the second most venomous snake species in the world. Now this is a true brown snake and they do get bigger than this. And you can see the beautiful brown coloration on that snake's head right there. It is very in tune with this situation. It recognizes the cameras, recognizes me, recognizes the fact that it's inside of a tube. Now, the reason for the tube is it keeps me safe, keeps the snake safe, and of course keeps the entire camera team safe. It's the best way for us to interact with the snake and take a close look at some of its cool features. You can see flicking its tongue out there. It's just sensing the environment. We're in a residential area. You may be saying to yourselves, coyote don't animals usually try to avoid human habitation? Not the case with this snake. In fact, the brown snake population has increased since humans have moved into environments like this. And the reason for that is that more humans mean more potential prey species. This snake specializes in eating rodents. Where you have humans, you're gonna have food scraps. Food scraps means more vermin. So this snake looks at a house like this, that's low to the ground, has stone floors, and it does not see a house. It just sees a maze of potential prey opportunities. Another reason people often encounter this snake is that it's a diurnal species. Look at those big eyes. These snakes have incredible eyesight. And if the snake's moving around during the day hunting, at the same time humans are moving around doing their day-to-day -day activities, you understand why encounters are much more frequent. And these things are fast, one of the fastest snake species here in Australia, and the strike speed is uncanny. You take one bite from the snake and you're dealing with a neurotoxic venom that is almost certain to kill you if you do not receive anti-venom. Just because the snake can be considered deadly, it's more so considered dangerous, right? Because of the anti-venom production that is being done here in Australia, very few people die from snake bites, specifically snake bites from the species, but, it's dangerous because of its close proximity to human habitation. The more times you have humans around an area where there's gonna be snakes, the more chances you will have of bites occurring. Whether it's on the feet, on the hands, or any part of your body. If you are unfortunate enough to run into this snake and you receive a bite, trust me, it's gonna be a really bad day. Now in an instance where you were to come into your bathroom and see a snake and say to yourself, oh no way buddy, this is my bathroom, I'm gonna have to eliminate you. You try to kill a snake like this, it's only going to increase your chances of being bitten. So the right thing to do is always call a local authority, somebody like Lockie who can come in and safely remove the snake and put it back out into the wild. Oh buddy, it's a good thing that we came across you first because we're going to actually save you and move you to a much more remote location where hopefully there'll be plenty of food sources and uh, you will not find yourself in any sort of danger. But there you have it. The work that Australian Wildlife Encounters is doing on a daily and weekly basis put to the test. Quick, efficient, and the snake and the humans are walking away completely safe. Last step is to get it into a bag so we can transport it to a more wild location. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. <laughs> we'll see you on the next adventure. All right, Lock, you right. want to come in with the bag? Get him in here. Woo! Bring this down low. Yeah. Get him in slowly. Yep. And then let him feed in. Keep this bag high. Okay. Woo! Snake in the bag. All right, let's get this tied up. <laughs> yep. Let's move him around. That is like the ultimate snake that we could have possibly come across. All right, we're going to get this snake into a wild location, and uh, this little danger noodle is ready to go. Snakes belong outside, not inside the house. 
But if you find yourself in this terrifying situation, make sure to contact Australian Wildlife Encounters so they can safely relocate your resident serpent. When it comes to creatures that humans are afraid of, I always say there's the three big S's. Sharks, spiders, and snakes. You're very unlikely to be attacked or bitten by these animals. Yet unfortunate accidental encounters do happen. And in a worst case scenario, a single bite could put your life on the line. Today we are visiting the Reptile Discovery Center, located in DeLand, Florida. Owned and operated by Carl Barden, this Serpentarium is home to dozens of the world's most dangerous snakes, many of which are on display to educate the public. This location is also a Medtox and Venom laboratory, and it's the dangerous work going on behind the scenes that is saving human lives. Ooh, venomous reptiles. Good morning, Carl. Coyote, how you doing? Welcome. Good, how Thanks are you? Thank you for coming. Mara? Good morning, Coyote, welcome. Thank you guys so much for having me. This looks like the ultimate snake milking setup. This process is incredibly important. You guys are milking these snakes for the creation of antivenom. So tell us a little bit about this process. And I would classify this as arguably the most dangerous job in the United States at this point. But we never see it that way. We always think um, it's pretty well practiced. We do it so frequently. We handle 50 to 100 snakes a day, uh, typically four or five days a week. And probably most importantly, a number of these venoms are produced for the antivenoms, both here in North America and around the world. So let me just repeat that real quick. You said between 50 and 100 snakes a day. Have you ever been bitten in the process of milking snakes? Because yeah, accidents you know, do happen. We have about 500,000 venom extractions now, and every once in a while, right, he zigs and you zag, and the whole thing goes bad. So I've had 11 snake bites um, in the last 27 years. Only nine of those resulted in envenomation and actual hospital stays. We had two of those bites were dry. Um, but then you'll see the, the work here at the table is close work, but it's really uh, rehearsed and it's done very carefully and methodically. And so we like to think it can be done very safely. So the first snake that we're gonna get out from this, you see there's these enclosures behind me. Now, let me ask you this question real quick. How many snakes total do you guys have on? We've got those? about 1,000 on site right now, about 500 on the venom line. Okay. The first snake that we're gonna take a look at is the Southern Copperhead, and oh wow. Oh my gosh, beautiful. And that's a wow. big example of a Southern. I was um, this gonna is say. about the, si the, the, the Northern <laughs> size. I mean, this is about as big as these guys get, and uh, she's really a perfect example. That's a big copperhead. I was gonna say, I've seen my fair share of copperheads. This is without question the biggest one I've ever seen. Wow. I'm gonna pivot out, Mara, and let you get into position, and we are going to begin the milking process. Copperhead. Now, where would you rank the toxicity of the copperhead's venom as compared to uh, a cotton mouth or a, a diamondback, right? So this is not necessarily a bite that's gonna kill you. Typically, no. Typically, no. Copperhead venoms are not seen as especially toxic. Copperhead venom is extremely hemolytic, so hemorrhage and destroys blood cells and this kind of thing. And that's a lot of copperhead venom, something like 50 milligrams in a shot, perhaps a little bit more for her. And. Um, probably takes well over 100 milligrams of copperhead venom to actually kill somebody. So it's just not typically a lethal dose that you get in a bite. She's beautiful. If you want to touch her, it's just a spectacular snake oh my gosh. in every regard. And we always think that color, that pattern is just unmatched. Amazing. I mean, that venom yield right there, you can just hear the power of those fangs going into yeah, they you know, bite. the plastic you know, a covering very decisive there. bite, a rapid bite. And so, you know, it's an easy snake. You can see why copperheads bite more people in the eastern United States than anything. Yep. You know? Wow. All right, we'll bring okay. her back, put her away. Whew. Oh, that was fantastic. And that's just our first snake. You ready? All right, this is it. I'm going to assist in the milking of a water moccasin. As soon as I give Carl the go ahead, the snake is coming out and then it's up to me to make sure that we get a good soft body press so that uh, Carl's not bitten in the process of what this is. All right, Carl, are you set? Okay, here we go. Bring out the viper. All right, again, kind of an average sized snake, perfect condition. And this is really typical of our local cottonmouth. This guy's a Volusia County snake. Um, she was caught right here as a baby. These guys are really prolific or, or common in some of the forests surrounding uh, Delant. All right, let's go. We'll bring this guy. I'm gonna do the same kind of sweep here. Come on in with your press. Good, okay. beautiful. You've got her, you're excellent. I've got her. Okay. You can pick her up. You're safe, good. Put your press down, get a hold of that body. Excellent, Coyote. Make sure your hand's covering that bench or you're gonna get... Oh, gonna get mussed on? Okay. Really good. 
really good. Let's see if she'll give us a shot here. There she goes. Oh, yeah, look at that. You can feel the, the power in the whole body when they bite down like that. Oh, yeah. There she goes Holy again. Macro. Nice, good. Perfect. All right, we're going to return her to her cage. Okay. You got her. Excellent, Coyote. All my hands are shaking. Job. You did it. You did it. <laughs> Then, really uh, you know, I, I was hands-on with the uh, snakes in Australia when we milked those species, but didn't necessarily have that pressure of having to gently pin down the body. Um, but anytime you're that close to one of these animals, I mean, even a slight margin of error can go catastrophically wrong. And from the venom yield that you see that came out of that snake, just unbelievable. Just one bite from one of these snakes. So hey, honey, that was excellent. I feel. I feel all that adrenaline rushing through me. That's one snake, and I wasn't even holding the snake by the head, so I can only imagine you doing this for a couple hours at a time, snake after snake after snake. And if you thought the water moccasin was impressive, now we're gonna bring out the Eastern Diamondback, which yeah. arguably is the most dangerous pit viper in the United States, based on venom yield. I have a feeling that this is going to be intense. Wow, that is a big Eastern Diamondback. I think I just went to the bathroom in my pants a little bit. Holy cow, look at the size of that snake. Wow. That might be the biggest Eastern Dimeback I have ever seen. Wow. Okay, so now one of the key elements Don't of- Don't get any closer any than closer. right now. Okay, yeah, no, I see she's, okay. she's, you know, I'm just gonna go like this and Good. talk over to the side like this, just in case you see she's in that classic S strike pose. Now, what makes these snakes so dynamic is that heat sensing pit on the front of their faces, right? So right now she's looking at me, she sees a heat signature that's definitely too big to be a prey item, which means I am likely a predator. I'm a threat at this moment. And like Carl said, I don't wanna get any closer because as you can see, they strike incredibly fast. And that strike happens so quick, if you're bitten by a snake of this size, it has the potential to kill you without question. No question about it. Right, an Eastern Diamondback, a bite from an adult Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake is a potentially fatal snake bite. There's no question. Now, when it comes to Eastern Diamondback versus Western Diamondback, which one do you think is more dangerous, Carl? You can see she's getting agitated now, I think now, both right? of those, I'm just gonna shift her on the table a little bit. Yep. I think both of those snakes are probably equally dangerous. Eastern Diamondback venom is probably just the slightest bit more toxic, mm -hmm. um, but to just a little bit. And quantity-wise and size-wise, both of those guys are very serious rattlesnakes. So I, I think you're probably an equal on danger. Is everybody good? I'm gonna go ahead and catch him. Uh, yes, it's, it's time. All right, here we go, guys. We're gonna do the... No I'm gonna shift. Yeah. I gotta shift and hold that maybe up. Take just a step back here. No pressure yet. The most dangerous job in the United States right here, folks. There's a little now to keep him on the table. I'm gonna shift him and a little bit. Off. Yeah. Carl, good. you're unbelievable. The focus that it takes, guys, to perform what this is. Don't change anything. You're good and easy. Wow, that is a very, very strong snake. Unbelievable muscular power without the body. Okay, you guys good? Whoa! That was a serious venom yield right there. My goodness. And that's really what makes the Eastern Diamondback so potentially dangerous, is that capability to really pile it out oh when they gosh. need to. Look at those fangs. Oh, and I actually see it's got a double set of fangs, which means it's getting ready to shut out one of those exactly fangs, right? right? That's well, exactly right. Fangs. Yeah. Yes. Wow, look at that. All right, guys, zoom in as best you can to get a shot of those fangs. You can see the hooked nature. If you're bitten by one of these snakes, it's going to be a very, very bad day. A bite from this viper will definitely kill you if you do not receive anti-venom treatment. Okay, is it okay to let go of the, the tail? Good. Wow, look at that rattle. Down. Okay, very good, back Coyote. in. Excellent. Oh, that, that was intense. I mean, just being able to control a snake of that size on a table like that is is a challenge. Wow, Carl, that was impressive, my friend. Holy job. mackerel. It's important to note that this venom will go into the creation of anti-venom, which eventually will save lives. So the work that Carl and Mara are doing here on a daily basis is saving anybody who accidentally comes upon one of these snakes and is bitten. Carl, I'm gonna give you a very dangerous thank you, sir. handshake to say thank you for having us behind the scenes at the lab here today to milk snakes. This was unbelievable. I'm sure one venom searing question that you all have is, what exactly happens when snake venom enters into the human body and reacts with its blood? Stay tuned, guys, because that episode is coming up next. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. 
We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, Carl, I'm gonna hand this off to you so that I don't drop it. That was crazy. Amazing job. Oh my gosh, I'm so stoked. Being bitten by an animal is one of the worst experiences most people can imagine. Yet no matter how careful you are, accidents can and do happen every year. In the United States, it is accurate to say that Carl and Mara are literally putting their own lives at risk to ensure that anyone who is bitten by a venomous snake has a fighting chance for survival. If you would like to visit the Reptile Discovery Center or learn more about their med toxin venom laboratories, make sure to visit the website and schedule your chance to see these snakes in action. The Brave Wilderness Channel is a collection of exciting and educational animal adventure videos. Barely even moved, it was like perfectly camouflaged and it just said, okay, you can't see me. I'll tell you what, I did see you. Yes, even the ones where I'm being bitten or stung ah! find themselves chock full of factual tidbits, tips, and tricks for avoiding these often misunderstood creatures in the wild. I believe that a big part of my role is to help people recognize the good in all animals, especially ones that a large percentage of people fear, like snakes and spiders. And while it's fair to say that these animals are feared worldwide, the species that live in Australia are often considered more terrifying because of their toxic nature. In fact, the world's most venomous snake and spider species call this island continent home and some of them have venom so powerful, it's guaranteed to kill a human without the administration of anti-venom. Today I'm returning to Australian Reptile Park. This wildlife sanctuary is the only facility in the country that milks both snake and spider venom for the production of anti-venom. It's a dangerous process, and several years ago, I had the chance to learn alongside the park's arachnid expert, Kane Christensen. You can actually see the, the drops of venom on the tips of the fangs, and that's what we want. We want to get that venom from those fangs into the pipette. If you thought milking a spider was dangerous, today's education will be even more extreme, as I will assist in milking the three most deadly snakes in the world. Okay, we're going to enter the most dangerous room on the planet, a room filled with venomous snakes. Zach, how are you? I'm good, yourself? Good to see you. Me too. I was just explaining to these guys that this has got to be the most dangerous room on the face of the planet. Every snake in here can potentially kill you, right? Oh, 100%. Second and third most toxic snakes in the world. Okay. So, pretty nasty. Now, the anti-venom that you guys create is saving lives every single day. How many people are bitten by these snake species on a yearly basis? Uh, so statistics are about three to 5,000 bites per year with anywhere up to three to 400 lives um, being saved with the anti-venom program. So it's pretty cool. Wow. Well, sweet. Let's get into milking. What is the first species we're going to look at? Uh, so we're going to look at the king brown of the mulga. So uh, the big boy. Okay. I'm going to let you do your thing. You let me know when you want me to come in to get hands on with the danger noodle. Right, yeah. So I'm going to grab the snake out of the enclosure. I'll get you guys to jump back at that point because He's quite big and he'll, uh, he'll swing around a fair bit if, he's, if he wants to. Uh, we'll then come over here. I'll, uh, I'll swing him onto the pinning pad and using the, uh, the pinner. Uh, so nice and soft to protect the snake and to protect myself. Uh, it's slightly tacky as well, so it gives me that split second of time where he uh, slightly sticks to it, but it doesn't hurt him at all. Yeah. And then we're gonna grab him and hopefully it all goes well. We'll be quiet and we'll let you focus. Oh my goodness. So yeah, you can see him a bit cranky. He's uh, not the happiest about this arrangement. Okay, where, where would you like me to go? Just right. So you just hang just there. Okay. And I'm gonna swing him, and then I'll get you to come in and just grab this back end for me. Okay. Just, uh, once I get him by the head, he's not gonna be happy. Yep, go ahead and just focus, do what you're doing. Grab the body? Yep, 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 got him. She is so powerful. Come over here. Yeah, that is a big, big mulga right there. Right, yeah. So now the trick is, because he's not a stupid animal, he wants to like me, not the jar. Just like your finger is the target. There we go. Oh my goodness. 
Oh, wow, that is a huge venom yield. So give goodness. his venom glands a bit of a massage, trying a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can see him just chewing on that thing. Wow, look at those fangs. Massive fangs for an elapid. Wow. That is like a grappling hook of teeth. Can I move around just to the side yeah. like this? Look at his face. Whoa. Oh, you can see him still chewing, still yeah. rejecting venom. Venom is still dripping. And he's not letting go. And the power in this snake's body is unbelievable. So big around, I can barely get my hands completely on it. That is a massive snake. I never imagined seeing a mulga of this size. So how do you get the snake off of the venom vial now? A little bit of manipulation, or there we go. Oh my goodness. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna get you to put it in. Okay. I promise I won't let go to love body, body first? Yeah, body first. Okay, here we go, here we go. Try it out. Now jump on back, because this is the okay. bit that goes a bit sketchy. Ready, three, two, one. Oh, nice job. That man. is a risky little game right there. <laughs> Woo! My heart is racing. <laughs> yeah. That was cool. And that is not the most dangerous snake we're gonna milk. So next on the list is the coastal tiger. Yeah, yeah right? we're stepping it up quite a bit. So this is another large bodied snake, except these ones are pretty nasty. Okay, well, let's go for the coastal taipan and see what happens. This thing is big too. Oh my. So normally we uh, we cool him down a little bit, so he's a little bit unsure what's happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, that might work to our advantage. Okay, ready? Yep. Yeah. Go. Wait, wait, wait. Yep, grab him. Okay, got him. What a cool looking snake. Is it ready? Yeah. I got pretty good hold on his body here. Ooh. Wow. Give those venom glands a little bit of a squeeze. Holy mackerel, that looks like more venom than the King Brown. Yeah. You're this... right, and you said he's the record holder for largest venom yield. Yes, yeah, so this guy's a pretty special animal. That is a bad time. Wow. So if you were to be bitten by this snake and have that much venom go into you, do you think there's a chance you're gonna survive? Uh, it wouldn't be a very good chance. Okay. Uh, just the sheer amount would almost drown your system. Well, that's a phenomenal amount and hugely toxic. It's rather hard to find a coastal taipan, is it not? Yeah, they're pretty secretive, but uh, it's when you're out bushwalking, you jump over a log and uh, they just get a bit spooked. There you go. Okay, ready to take them off the bio? Yeah, uh, I'm getting a bit nervous now, but yeah. he's a bit cranky. Okay, okay. So, same process. Same again, yeah, yeah, you to put the back first. end in. So yeah. much power in the body of that snake. So streamlined, love those scales. Okay. Right, I have to get that tail Still in. Going in. Okay. Three, Back two, up. one. <laughs> two down and <laughs> one more to go. And now we're stepping up again. Is the most dangerous snake in the world. That was intense. Oh, bringing in the stairs for this one. Yeah, I'm not quite that tall. And he's here waiting. Oh, nicely done. Wow, this thing's beautiful. And you gotta be quick with the hands, huh? to those two big ones anyway. Mm -hmm. That's Fine. all you need. That's it, the most deadly snake in the world right there. And just a single drop of that venom can kill you, correct? Yeah. So that drop there would kill about 250,000 mice. It's amazing to be hands-on with a snake that is this dangerous. I mean, even if I saw one of these in the wild, I don't think I would ever try to interact with it. I mean, we would film it from a safe distance. Would never even think about catching it or heading it or certainly taking a look at those fangs. And, and you know, the fangs are not nearly as big as the other species, but man, to just know that that venom is 
so incredibly toxic. And how many people are bitten by this snake every year? Very, very little. So these are found out in the middle of basically Australia. No one goes out there unless they're looking for these guys. Mm -hmm. And normally if they're looking for them, they know what they're doing. Um, we had someone get bitten by one last year and uh, he was in a coma for nearly a week. Wow. But uh, he made it through. Amazing, all right, want to take it off the vial? Uh, yes, please, my hand's starting to cramp up. I'll take this one okay. just because we're up on top. Yeah. I am not going to climb up there with you. Woo! <laughs> I'm sweating. You're not the only one. Are you ready? Steady. Nice. I thought he was coming back out then. <laughs> and not a ton in there, but just that much would kill you. So, it's a dangerous job, and it takes incredible focus, precision, and a lot of guts to do this on a weekly basis. But how rewarding is it to know that this venom is going towards saving the lives of anyone that's bitten by one of these snakes? Oh, it's it's awesome knowing that uh, I have an active part in saving lives. Like uh, me and Kane, we always say we're not smart enough to be brain surgeons, but we can save lives with the antivenom programs we have. I've had uh, people come in, and it generally happens on your worst week when everything's going wrong, and they'll come in and go, oh, you're the reason I'm here, or you're the reason I'm able to bring my kids here. It's, a, it's an incredible feeling. It just gives you chills. Like I've got goosebumps just talking about it. It's, yeah. it's awesome. Well, Zach, thank you so much for having us behind the scenes <laughs> here today welcome. at the Australian Reptile Park where we got to milk three of the most deadly snakes on the planet. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay <laughs> wild. We'll see you on the next location. Every year, a collision course with fate finds dozens of adventure seekers, outdoor enthusiasts, and even backyard gardeners bitten by one of Australia's most deadly creatures. Most bites happen by accident, and while no one ever wants to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, there is comfort knowing that wildlife experts such as Zach Bauer and Kane Christensen are fearlessly working to extract venom that will be used to save lives. The creation of anti-venom is a fascinating science, and if you would like to learn more information about Australian Reptile Park's milking program, make sure to visit their website. I'm on Australia's Sunshine Coast, and I'll be interviewing Leela, a woman who knows firsthand the dangers of interacting with a venomous snake. She's a bite victim survivor who nearly lost her life, and today, she's going to be sharing her incredible story. Now, what Leela doesn't know is that we're also going to be getting her face to face with a deadly snake whose venom, believe it or not, ultimately saved her life. For you, this all began in 1974, the day it all happened when you were bitten by a venomous snake. Can you take us back to that morning when you were heading out to the barn, you had farm animals and you were, you were barefoot. Like a lot of people in Australia walk around barefoot and you found yourself in the worst case scenario. Take us to that morning and tell us the story. Well, it happened in the afternoon, late afternoon, almost on dark. And I had a goat and I was putting the goat under the house. I mean, what goat wouldn't want to live underneath the house? <laughs> so yeah, I was happily putting her under the house. I had a baby and a two-year-old inside. Mm -hmm. And I felt this, like a pins and needles feeling, like pins and needles in my foot. And so I went inside and I thought straight away that I definitely had been bitten by a snake or a spider. Okay. I wasn't sure what. Um, the poison immediately went straight up to my head. Really? So I got a migraine headache. I've never had a migraine headache in my life. So I had this migraine headache and straight away I started to vomit. So I got the bucket and I'm leaning over the bucket vomiting and thinking, oh God, I need help, I need help. So I put my baby and my two-year-old and myself in the car with the bucket so I could keep vomiting in the bucket and go to the neighbours. And then the neighbour takes me straight to the Southport Hospital and at the Southport Hospital, the doctor thought I was, reckon I was a hippie and I was on drugs and I didn't know what I was talking about. That's an unfair judgment. Very unfair. And um, gave me a blood test and left me all night with no antivenine, no nothing. And um, I was yelling out for help because I was getting feverish and I knew they weren't doing anything for me and I was screaming out for help. I want my acupuncturist to come to the hospital. An acupuncturist in the 70s? <laughs> yeah, and the acupuncturist actually made it up to the hospital. He heard somehow on the grapevine. Certainly no text he, messaging he back then. No, no mobile phones <laughs> back then. He came up to the hospital and he felt, because acupuncturists, they go on your pulse. Everything's on your pulse. Mm -hmm. He felt my pulse and he felt every muscle fighting the venom. 
And the next morning, I had fallen into a coma and every muscle had collapsed and I couldn't breathe. And so they found the venom in my blood test and then they gave me the antivenin, but it wasn't, I, I, I couldn't breathe at this stage. Yeah. So they had to put me into an ambulance and race me to intensive care in Brisbane, which was about a hundred kilometers. And so I was on oxygen in the ambulance. Just as they got to the hospital, they ran out of oxygen, I died. They raced me up. Well then, you died. I died, my heart stopped beating, they raced me up to intensive care, and they got me going, they got me breathing. How did they get you breathing? Did they have to put a tube down into they your They had to put lungs? tubes all over me okay. and in my mouth. And they leave the tubes in your mouth for five days. And after five days, they have to do tracheotomy because uh, it can get infected. Yeah. So they had to do a tracheotomy where they open up your throat and they put a machine into your throat, a tube, and the machine is actually breathing for you because you cannot breathe on your own. So a lot of the snakes in Australia have a, a neurotoxic venom, which ultimately can cause your internal system to go into a state of paralysis and collapse. And it sounds like that's exactly yeah, and what I had I you. had big hematomas in my groins, which are big black bruises, yeah. which are hematomas are internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. So I had internal bleeding and um, I was in the coma for six days. Wow. And uh, then after that, I regained my consciousness. So the moment that you came back, let's call this day seven into your ordeal, do you remember waking up out of this coma? I do. I do. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm, this is a dream. Really? I'm, I'm having a dream. This can't be real. This can't be real. So once you've woken up out of the coma, like were you just kind of like a cucumber there in your bed? Like at that point, had your muscles had gained no I had no back. strength. I had no strength. They, they set me up and I just fell back down again. I had no strength at all. I must to, have been so scary. It was a slow, a slow um, process of my muscles building back up. So you're in the coma, um, you come out of it, and I imagine your first question to the doctors would be, do we know what kind of snake bit me? Do you know at this point which species it was? I don't know if I knew at that point, but David Flay mm -hmm. from Fauna and Flora Reserve in Burley Heads, mm -hmm. who had it for many, many years on the Gold Coast, he was an expert on snakes and he diagnosed the snake as a rough scale snake. Ooh, yeah, no rough scale snake. I mean, that aligns with the uh, symptoms that you had from the venom. And here's the thing about a rough scaled snake, very unassuming looking snake, small head, small mouth. So I could see if you got a bite from that snake, fast striking and very, very small fangs, but very potent venom. So Leela, after you get out of the hospital and you're back home, between 1974 and now, do you have any long lasting yes. symptoms? You do? Yes, I don't have any reserves. So if I go downhill, I can't pull on any reserves. I've just got to go to bed and go to sleep. In fact, I've got to lay down at lunchtime every single day. And I've got to recuperate because um, my nervous system is damaged from the snake venom. The snake venom affects your central nervous system and that's one thing is permanently damaged from the snake bite is my nervous system. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. So a lot of people out there have a fear of snakes. It's called ophidiophobia. So I have to ask you, previously or now or after this experience, were you afraid of snakes or are you now afraid of snakes given that one nearly took you I'm not life? afraid of snakes, no, because I love animals. Mm -hmm. I love animals and I just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And I respect snakes. I respect all animals. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's a fantastic message. I think a lot of people would assume if somebody was bitten by a snake and it nearly killed them that like, snakes, this is why I don't like them. But you're right. I mean, snakes are doing an amazing thing for the planet. They are the control for all of the species that we as humans usually try to have not get into our house. All of the vermin species, the mice and different rodents. I, I believe that snakes will just want to really just get out of your road, mm -hmm. you know. They just want to get on with their life. They're not out there to kill you, you know? they're not out there to bite you. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a little something extra lined up today. I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but would you be comfortable... A snake. 
We have, we a have, we are in the vicinity snake. of a snake. Not a rough scaled snake, oh. the tiger snake. The snake that is actually responsible for providing the venom that created an anti-venom to save your life. Would you be up for meeting a tiger snake? Today? I would, I'd like to meet it. I don't yeah. hold it. It will be totally controlled. And if you want, you'll even be able to pet its tail. No, 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 no. You don't think you'll pet its tail? No. You might when you see how pretty no, the snake I don't is. Know. <laughs> we'll cross that bring bridge on, when we get to it. But you at least seeing the snake, that's a huge step. And saying that you're not afraid of snakes, most people, had they been bitten by a snake, would have immediately said, whoa, 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 hold on. You're, you've, have, you've got a snake here in the same vicinity as me. So I love that you immediately, oh, you. I saw your eyes light up. You're like, no, thank no, no, you. I love snakes. I would love to see what this snake is. Thank so you. that is going to be the next piece of this episode, getting Leela up close and personal with the very snake species whose venom ultimately saved her life. I'm a fighter, you know. Yeah. I, I fought my way back. I reckon. Yeah. I'm here today because I'm a fighter. Okay, Leela, we've got you in the room of snakes. Now, I know you're not afraid of snakes. We've already accomplished that, but the tiger snake is going to be coming out here. Lockie's going to get it onto the floor. We're back with plenty of distance. We're gonna get it inside of the tube and you'll see how that completely controls the snake's head. So it keeps us and the animal completely safe. It's always a little nerve wracking though anytime one of these venomous snakes comes out of its enclosure. Ooh. See that? So now that the snake is in the tube, we'll work it up just a little bit further. Okay, cool, snake is under control. And now we're going to move a little stool in for you to sit on. Right. Are you comfortable? Yep. Okay, cool. Locky, we're good? Okay. Leela, feeling okay? Yeah. Okay, there it is, the tiger snake. You can see why it's called the tiger snake, that beautiful tiger pattern. Now, they come in a variety of different colors. This one specifically, I would say, is extra beautiful. It kind of looks like the white Siberian tiger version. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Leela, is this your first time encountering a venomous snake since the bite incident? Yes. It is. Wow, that's a big step. Here we are 50 years later and you're in the room with the very animal whose toxic venom ultimately became the thing that saved your life. Wow. Hmm. How are you feeling right now? A little yeah, more nerve-wracking to be in a room of snakes no, than no, it is on the porch? Fine. Totally relaxed, okay. Yeah. Now, what are the odds, do you think, that you are able to just gently pet the snake's back? Do you think you could do that? The back. The back of it. What about the tail? You could touch the tail, yeah. You want to pet the tail? Okay, yep. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, but nothing can hurt you. See how the, the snake's head obviously completely contained with inside of that tube. And this is a rather secretive snake species, so unless you're in the right place at the right time to see the snake, which as a team we are often looking to do, but for anybody out there wanting to avoid snakes, there's a good chance you'd be able to avoid this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, and when applicable, milking the venom from this species is what is saving people that are bitten. So it's pretty cool that this snake and the, the science that's being done to save lives comes from such a cool animal. You want to touch it on the back there? Beyond the tail, or oh, we're working beyond the tail at this point? Pretty smooth, huh? Yeah. A lot of people think that snakes are slimy. They certainly are not. The scales are very dry, very sleek, and very powerful. You can see how it's just slowly inching itself forward in the tube, and I'm gonna let it come up just a little bit more like this, and I'm gonna let the head just peek out a tiny bit so that Mario can get that shot, but don't worry, you're still gonna be completely safe. There we go. Look at that, pretty cool to see. See that? that oh, face. Look at that. He's like, I want to just keep going. So. Just don't put it, point it this way. Oh look at my that. God. He's yawned right at oh, you. Oh, no. That was basically him saying, oh, hey. No, I'm hi. starting to feel a bit nervous Leland. now. Leland. Oh, no, nice to meet to get, you. Nice to meet I'm starting you. I feel a little bit nervous Ooh. now. A little bit nervous now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think at this point, what I would love to do is show you the proper treatment for a snake bite. Yeah, this is like a good idea. Probably a good idea to get it back into its enclosure yeah, at this point. Yeah, I think point. so, yeah. All right, I'm gonna hand the tiger, everybody back up just a little bit there. Tiger's coming back over to Lockie. Let me know when you're comfortable. Good, okay, got it. And there we have it. 
I patted it. You I did. Patted. You did. That's it. That's I even such patted a huge back. Step. I patted it. You back. patted. Yeah. You, huh? and you see, and up I there, you're like, no, I'm that. not going to be able to pat it. But then you uh, saw. You realized, oh, it's not that scary. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> that was amazing, Leela. We did it. You told your story to the world. You got face to face with the venomous snake and even touched it. As the sun cut through the tops of the cypress trees, I carefully made my way into the swamp. Every step counts when you're in the back country of South Texas. And as my boots slowly splashed through the dark water, my focus was completely in tune with the environment. I knew that it was only a matter of time before I would find the one reptile that most people are terrified of. Coyote, what are you looking for? Snakes, and nothing yet. You know, most people are out there and they're hiking and they stumble upon snakes when they don't expect to. Me, I'm always looking for them. But if you do come across one in the wild, it's really important to identify the species. A lot of times you have a non-venomous snake that will look like a venomous one. Unfortunately, these non-venomous snakes are then vilified as being venomous, and a lot of times they end up being killed. Uh, my goal today is to catch one non-venomous snake and one venomous snake so that we can show you the distinct differences between the two. It's a long search out here in the swamps. I'm not giving up. We are going to find some snakes. that this one is non-venomous. Bring up in the light, check that out. That is a broad-banded water snake. Woo, okay, that is half of the equation right there. Watch your GoPro, he's trying to bite you. Well, that's the safe one. Now we gotta find the moccasin. Woo, awesome, man, definitely got my thumb. A bite from this one and I'm gonna be just fine. But the other snake we're looking for, the water moccasin, if that had tagged my thumb, we wouldn't be getting shots. We'd be on our way to the hospital. Look at that. Maybe get a little closer to the camera there. Oh, he's bitey. Beautiful snake. Okay, cool. Well, let's keep searching for moccasins. What you did not want to do is just accidentally step on a venomous snake. This is definitely moccasin territory. Moccasin right there. Okay, come up slow. Where? Right up against the side of that tree. Oh, I wow, see. look at how big it is. Um, okay, now this is the real deal. Stay back. Okay. Stay a couple steps back. Now, they usually move pretty slow. I'm gonna try to hook it and bring it up here on the path. You ready? Yep. Careful. from this snake. That one will send you to the hospital. Okay, bringing it up on the path here. Wow, okay, ooh, rattling the tail a little bit. That is a defensive sign, okay. Uh, 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 tss, 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 tss. It should just stop for us. Come here, come here. There we go. All right, what we need to do now is just get the snake under control so that we can get it up close for the cameras. Let me move it back a little bit here. Ah, my nerves are going. Just looking into the water there, and that's how well these things camouflage. I just saw it out of the corner of my eye, just an obscure shape up against that cypress. And that's what these snakes will do. You don't often see them just slithering about like you would a water snake. They'll often be just like this, curled up in a ball somewhere, trying to stay camouflaged, trying to stay away from any potential predators. And then again, if you were gonna try to eat this snake, you better be quick, because if you're tagged by those fangs, you are going to be in a world of trouble. Now this is a water moccasin, but they are famously known as cottonmouths. And watch this, I'll get the snake to open its mouth and you'll see that white throat. Look at that. Now that is a defense, oh, see, look, you got the tail going now too. You see that? Mimicking a rattlesnake, saying, I am venomous. Yes, we know that you were venomous. 
I can actually see the fangs tucked back. Woo! I am dripping bullets of sweat right now. Let me back up a touch. Okay, well, perfect. We have the two snake species that are indigenous to this habitat a water moccasin and a broad banded water snake. One venomous, one that is not. Stick around and we'll show you which is which. Check this out. Completely calm now, considering the fact just a few minutes ago, this snake was doing everything it could to bite me and get away. This is the broad banded water snake. And look at this incredibly calm demeanor. Now I noticed the same thing with Lake Erie water snakes and Northern water snakes. At first, it's all about fight or flight. If they can't get away and you catch them, they immediately try to bite you. Now the good news for me, like I said before, is that this is a non-venomous species. So how big did the snakes get? I mean, are these snakes get as big as a northern water snake? Yeah, they do. I would say this is about average size for one of these snakes. It is, I'd say, about two and a half feet in length, uh, but they can grow to be about three and a half or four feet at a maximum size. Females are larger than the males, and uh, I do believe it's a male looking at its cloaca. Yeah, you're a handsome fella, aren't you? Now, these snakes are often misidentified. People see them near the water and they automatically think it's a water moccasin. This is a very common species all across the southeastern United States. And the reason people mistake it for a water moccasin is mostly the fact that A, it's right by the water, and B, the coloration. I'm gonna turn the snake just a little bit. You see all that dark brown that runs the length of the body, and then that faded banding looks just like a younger water moccasin. But then, of course, if you flip the snake over and look at its belly, look at all that copper checkering. You will not find that on a water moccasin. And not that you'd ever necessarily see the belly of the snake, but I just think that that's really, really cool looking. <laughs> this is actually the first time I have caught this species of snake, and it is just so incredibly calm right now. I cannot believe how comfortable this snake has gotten with us. And we've only been handling it for a few minutes. Oh, but it did musk on me. There you go. See that white stuff on my hand right there? Oh, yeah, it stinks. That is another defense mechanism. Poop on a potential predator if it's trying to eat me. All right, but I'm not going to eat you. Don't worry. We can just hang out and be friends. Wow, this snake. So cool. Well, I think at this juncture we should bring out the water moccasin. I'm gonna hand this snake off to Mario. He's gonna bring in the moccasin. This is gonna be a little bit more dangerous. Hopefully we'll get that snake to just calm down on the ground and we'll get the cameras up close for it so we can show you the distinct field markings of that snake. All right, you ready? Yep. All right, now we're gonna bring in the water moccasin. Uh, just keep your wits about you because this is going to be slightly more dangerous. Okay, let me bring her over here. Slightly is an understatement. Yeah. Hold on, I'm gonna get her to stop. Here we go. So, Coyote, the water snake you just held had anticoagulant in its saliva. This snake has venom. What would this snake do to you? This snake would, depending how your body reacted, it could potentially kill you. There are not many reported deaths from water moccasin bites. However, that venom is incredibly toxic and it will break down your red blood cells. You could lose a finger, you could lose your hand. Let's just put it this way. If I'm tagged by this snake, we are leaving the scene and we are heading to the hospital. So I need to be extra careful right now. Mark, we've got you a couple feet past the snake. We've got Mario just off camera here, making sure the snake makes a move. He can keep it away from you, Mark. But other than that, if we just stay calm and collected, just like this in front of the snake, we should be just fine. You see the snake's not trying to flee, it's just keeping itself low to the ground, it's body spread. Look how wide and girthy that snake is. Now, these snakes, like the banded water snakes, are aquatic. However, they do not dive down underwater to hunt. You will see them occasionally moving from pocket of water to pocket of water, but they usually are hunting on the embankment. These snakes do not have rattles like rattlesnakes, and they rely on their camouflage to keep them hidden. A lot of times people will be walking down a trail, you accidentally step on the snake, and that's how you were bitten. This snake has no interest in chasing or hurting humans. If you just admire this animal from a safe distance, you're gonna be just fine. Okay, so the most important part of this episode is that we want to show you a comparison of this snake next to the broad banded water snake. Now to do that, I'm going to have to get the water moccasin under control, which means I'm going to use my snake hook to gently pin its head and then pick the snake up. Mario's going to bring in the broad banded water snake, we're going to put them side by side and show you the distinct field marks so that you can properly identify these snakes if you ever come across them in the wild. I am 
gently going to get position of her head, just like this. There we go. I want my fingers just behind the head like that. Okay. This is the most dangerous thing you can do with a venomous snake. Yep. Never, ever, ever do what you see me doing here. I'll get full control of the body. There we go. Yeah, oh, you notice my hand is shaking. Now, never, ever, ever try to pick up a venomous snake like you just saw me do. And the only reason that I headed this snake is so that we can get both of these right next to each other. I've got a gentle yet firm grip on the back of her head, just behind the venom glands, and full control of the body. You won't see me moving too much more for this scene. I just gotta kinda collect my nerves, stay calm. Uh, Mario, go ahead and bring in the broadband water snake. There we go. Cool, look at a that. A little nervous? A little bit. <laughs> kind of have a dangerous snake here in my hand. She's calmed down a bit. You can see her tongue's flicking out now, so that's good. She's not trying to expose her fangs. Now, the water moccasin, because it is a pit viper and it has these two massive venom glands, has a very triangular-shaped head. You pan over to the broad-banded water snake, and its head is actually very narrow. Mm -hmm. However, when these broad-banded water snakes are threatened, they will flatten their heads and puff them up, forming them into a triangle, which oftentimes causes people to miss identify them for water moccasins. It's good news for the snake if it drives off a predator, but it's bad news if that predator is a human, and then unfortunately that snake usually ends up being killed. Um, sorry, a little nervous. Um, let's look on the heads as well at the snake's eye. So I'm gonna just slightly turn. Right, I'll, the... I'll move, you, you okay. stay there. Okay. You'll notice that the water moccasin has a vertical pupil, while the banded water snake has a circular pupil. I don't imagine anybody out there watching is ever going to get face to face with either of these snake species, but if you happen upon one and you see a vertical pupil, you know it's a moccasin and you know that it's venomous. Now the last difference on the face of these snakes is the fact that the water moccasin is a pit viper. Now right up front there you'll see a nostril, and just behind that you see another hole in between the nostril and the eye. That is the heat sensing pit, which allows these snakes to detect not only their prey, but potential predators in the environment. Now, when you look at the broadbanded water snake, you'll notice that it does not have pits, just eyes and nostrils. When you look at these two snakes overhead, you can see how similar they are in coloration. Now, the broadbanded water snake has more distinct banding, but if you were to just see these snakes at a quick glance, they are pretty similar looking. But you'll notice that the water moccasin has a much girthier, flattened body as compared to the banded water snake. Look at that difference right there but their scales look similar. They do, don't they? And both species have rough keeled scales, which allows them to quickly be able to move through this rugged environment. Can we see the bellies? I know there's, that's another big difference. Yep. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Now, you would, you're never likely to see the belly of these two snakes next to each other, but as you can see, the banded water snake is beautiful and checkered, and the water moccasin is just kind of plain and cream colored. Not that that makes the snake any less special. I smell something, coyote. You do, I smell that same thing. Both of these snakes right now are musking, which is a final defense tactic in the event that something tries to eat them. That musk is coming out of their bottom ends, and if you're a predator and you get that in your mouth, it tastes really bad. So, as you can tell, these snakes have many different defenses against potential predators. For everyone out there watching, we want you to know that these two snakes are very difficult to distinguish from one another. And if you see a snake out there in the wild, definitely treat it as if it's venomous. If it's a moccasin and you take a bite, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So it's best to just always admire these animals from a safe distance. Working with snakes is one of the most dangerous aspects of this job. And the reason I do it is so that we can learn about these incredible animals and hopefully walk away with a newfound respect, or even the ones that we are afraid of. With the setting of the hot Florida sun comes the rise of its nocturnal predators. Some of these creatures, like the American alligator, are not the kind of foe you would ever want to stumble upon while out exploring in the Everglades. And despite the fact that alligators rarely attack humans, their natural instinct is to hunt under the cover of darkness. All the more reason to steer clear of their environments at night. On this humid evening, we are back en route towards civilization after filming a selection of sunset B-roll shots. Traveling the back roads at night, believe it or not, 
is actually a great place to stumble upon a variety of snake species that slither up from the swampy waters and onto the asphalt to absorb the daytime's remaining heat. Much to our delight, this is exactly the scenario we encountered, and you are now about to witness one of America's most dangerous snakes. Holy cow, okay. I got the GoPro rolling. Mario, get the lights, get the lights. Give me that snake tong. We have got a huge water moccasin. Here, here, here. Give me this, give me this. It is right in the middle of the road. Go slow, go slow. Mark, kill the car. Keep the lights on though. Holy cow. That is the biggest water moccasin I have ever seen. Wow. Look at that snake. That thing is huge. All right, we're gonna wait until we've got the lights out. Massive water moccasin just in front of us here. You can't tell how big it is on the GoPro, but it is massive. That is a huge water moccasin. Oh, 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 he's starting to move. He's curling into a tighter ball. I'm gonna try to come on this side of it. That's exactly what we want right there. See how it's curling up into a tight little ball? Perfect defensive pose right there. Wow, that is a massive snake. That's the water moccasin for you right there. The quintessential cotton mouth. I'm definitely gonna keep my snake tongs in between me and the snake. These snakes are capable of striking up to three feet in length. It will lunge its entire body forward. You can see it's puffing itself up right now, trying to be bigger, saying, I'm a big snake. Yes, we are aware that you are a big snake. In fact, this is the largest water moccasin I have ever seen. Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the back of his tail there. See that little wiggling of the tail? Mimicking the movements of a rattlesnake, trying to warm me back up. I am agitated. You can see he's puffing up his body now. Woo! Woo! Did you see that? Yeah. I barely even moved, brought the snake tongs back and it struck at me. Look at the position that his head is in right now. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I just wanna test the distance of his strike here. So he's gonna strike again. Okay. He's got his back to you, Mark, which is good for you. Not necessarily good for me. Oh, you see that? Another strike. Okay, I've kinda tested his limits. He's still got an okay shot there? Yeah. And look at how heavy body this snake is. There's no way you would mistake a water moccasin of this size for just a normal water snake. And oftentimes those two species are confused for each other. As you guys know, we've done an episode in the past, we've compared the water moccasin to the water snake. And at that point, we compared two snakes that are of similar size. This thing is an absolute giant. And one way to easily identify a moccasin when it's fully adult like this, look at the banding right on the side of the face. Mario, see if you can zoom in on that there. Oh, wow, just bit the tongs, did you see that? Okay, completely spun its body around. Go ahead and zoom in there, get a good shot. Let me get on my feet, he's a little closer than I'd yep. be when laying on the ground. There. Now, if the snake does decide to take off, Mario, Mark, you both just get up and I'll, I'll get a hold of it with the tongs or, or get in front of it. There you go, now you can get a better idea of just how long this snake is. I'd see it's close to three and a half feet in length. Ooh, an incredibly dangerous snake. Now when I say this moccasin is big, it's almost an understatement. I wanna give you guys something for scale. What I'm gonna do is actually move the GoPro with the snake tongs in close to the snake. Oh, she struck right out at the camera. I guess he doesn't like GoPros. So you can have something in there for scale. Can you see that? Oh yeah. So that's a GoPro next to the head of that snake. The snake's head is almost as large as the GoPro is. When it comes to the girth of its body, I would say in circumference, it's probably close to six or seven inches and the length of the snake is around three to three and a half feet. This is without question the largest water moccasin I've ever seen. Now, as we know, the water moccasin has a very popular nickname, the cottonmouth. What they'll oftentimes do is curl up in a tight ball and then bend their head back and gape their mouth open. The inside of the mouth is bright white, just like a cotton ball. And as we know, that bright white coloration is aposematic, warning any predator that this bright color means that I am potentially toxic. Now, when you're talking copperheads versus water moccasins versus rattlesnakes, I would say that the water moccasin is 
pretty much right there in the middle when it comes to toxicity. Armed with a hemotoxic venom, and if you were bitten by this snake, there is no question about it, you were going to find yourself on the way to the hospital. All right, Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the snake's head. See how he's got his head positioned up like that and has a very triangular shape to it. Almost looks like the spade of a shovel, the front of a shovel. That signifies that this is a venomous snake. I know we featured this snake species on the channel before, but most of those have been small to medium sized. So as we were just driving out of the Everglades here and we saw the snake, we had to stop the vehicle, get the lights out, get the cameras, and get a couple of really cool shots. All right, that's exactly what we want right there. He says, curled himself up into a bit of a tighter ball. Oh. Oh. Okay, or he's ready to strike and he just completely bit down and wrapped his head around the snake tongs. Look at all of the venom on the tongs. the tongs. Let me get a shot of that real quick. That's crazy. Wow, that's a lot of venom. Yeah. Now you may be asking yourself, what is this snake doing in the center of the road like this at night? We actually just finished filming sunset B-roll shots. We're getting ready to drive ourselves out of the Everglades and here's this giant right in the middle of the road. What the snakes will do at night is come out and lay on the asphalt to warm up. Now the water moccasin is primarily a nocturnal species. So what's getting ready to do now is after it heats up, it's gonna head off into this underbrush and it's gonna begin hunting. Now, as a semi-aquatic pit viper, they have a really incredible opportunity to be in the water and hunting for things like fish and amphibians. Now, as compared to the other venomous pit vipers that we have in the United States, like rattlesnakes and copperheads, this is the only one that's actually capable of spending a significant amount of time in the water. Well, at this juncture, I think it's probably best that we gently move the snake off the side of the road so another car doesn't come and accidentally run it over. This is a pristine specimen when it comes to the quintessential water moccasin. How cool is this? Stumbling upon one of the most notorious pit vipers here in the Everglades. All right, buddy, let's move you off the road here. <laughs> Came right at me. All right, there we go. The snake is now safely on the side of the road. He's gonna disappear into the underbrush and continue his night of hunting. See you later, big guy. Of all the venomous snake species in the United States, it is a valid statement to say that the water moccasin is one of the most dangerous. They are quick striking and incredibly defensive if cornered. Their venom is not the most potent, however, when they deliver a bite, it usually comes with a powerful punch and a heavy yield of toxins that will most certainly send you to the hospital. It's important that you never try to catch or harass one of these snakes. And if you see one in the wild, remember that like all slithering reptiles, they simply want to be left alone. And if you walk in the opposite direction, your encounter with a notorious cottonmouth will be a completely safe one. Brave Wilderness has become culturally synonymous with animal bites and stings. In the name of science and entertainment, Ow. I've taken on my fair share of painful encounters. Oh, it's stuck in my arm. But some bites are far too dangerous when it comes to human trial. So that is where technology comes in. We have teamed up with Ohio HD, one of the Midwest's premier production houses. Renowned for their arsenal of high-end equipment, they are considered experts in executing creative ideas with specialized solutions. And today, we are combining our talents to bring you into the Strike Zone. On this episode, we're going to take you into the slow motion Strike Zone of the mangrove snake and the water moccasin. To capture these predator strikes, we will be using a phantom high-speed camera capable of capturing 1,000 frames per second at full 4K resolution. Then, by slowing down the footage, we will be able to closely analyze and break down why these strikes are so effective and ultimately lethal. Wow. Here we go. Also joining our party is the Bolt High-Speed Cinebot, which can go from standstill to high-speed motion in a fraction of a second. Yep, it's a robot with a camera for a head that can move faster than a human. Trust me, I was just as impressed as you are. Now, before we enter the strike zone, first, 
let me introduce our fearless wildlife experts, Mario Aldecoa and Mike Easter. They will help to ensure that everything goes according to plan. Remember, safety for the animals and our crew is always the number one priority. There you have it. The cast of characters is set. So if you guys are ready, let the strikes begin. Okay, that's good. Let's turn it. So where we're gonna set this up is right here on this amazing tree branch sculpture. Now, Mario, are you setting up for somebody's birthday? No, it's no one's birthday. This is a prop. It is a balloon. And we are going to use this to entice a snake to strike out and hopefully pop the balloon in slow motion. Okay, what snake species is going to be striking at this balloon? We're gonna be using a mangrove snake. It is a mildly venomous colubrid from Southeast Asia. Okay, fingers crossed, let's see what happens. Oh, that's really good, all right? Uh, this, this is gonna be it. This, of course, does not hurt the snake in any way. The only injury will come to the balloon. Okay, ready, 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 is that good? Yep. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was the one. That was it. Wow. Okay, so careful with your camera right there. The snake is still in strike pose. <laughs> that was a good strike. That was pretty cool. That noise was loud inside of the studio, too. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've been waiting for, it's time to enter the strike zone. Okay, this is the moment. This is where we review the footage to find out if we got the strike. Man, the shot is crisp. Look at the snake. His mouth is already gaped open. Here comes the balloon into the shot. He's going. It seems like it lasts forever. I expect it to come so much quicker. Casey, nice. I see you're panning up. Yep. That's perfect. That's great. Yeah, you can actually see yeah. the teeth hanging down from the roof of his mouth. The anticipation. <laughs> Thousand frames so a second last a long time. Here, Here comes the strike. Here, Here it comes. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> wow, that was incredible. Oh, oh that is one heck of a shot right there. Yeah. Dancing in the treetops is no challenge for this arboreal reptile. And what's more terrifying is that this killer usually hunts at night. Combining its excellent vision to pick up on even the slightest movement, it's then the snake's forked tongue that ultimately helps this lethal predator zero in and lock its strike. The S-shaped stance allows the reptile to spring forward, and if the strike is successful, it will hold on to the prey and begin to chew. Maneuvering the victim toward its rear fangs, where a mild venom is slowly injected. To humans, this bite is not fatal, but to birds, small mammals, and lizards, this is a very slow and agonizing end. All right, guys, water moccasin is coming on to set. Already got the gape going. Oh, already in strike pose. Oh, That's look at nice. that. We've got this log situation set up here, and the hopes is that the water moccasin is going to coil right here, and then we are going to slowly add in a warm water balloon and see if those heat-seeking pits are capable of striking out and giving us quite the show. I think this is gonna work. Well, we got the mangrove snakes to strike. Supposedly water moccasins are a lot more aggressive. I think this is gonna work. Well, let's see some action. We want a water moccasin strike in slow-mo. Casey, how's that framing look for you? I'm feeling good here. Okay, Mike, we feel good about the snake? Feel good. Okay, and I think we're ready. Oh. Oh. <laughs> wow, what just happened? He struck at the balloon. <laughs> I forgot about the water actually. Wow. Oh, so yeah. with virtually okay. insane speed, that snake struck out those fangs, hit the balloon, an explosion of air and water everywhere. That was going to be one very Epic slow motion shot. You feel good about that, Casey? I love that. Oh, if Casey likes it, I like it. All right, uh, I say let's review the clip. 
This is it, reviewing the footage of the water moccasin strike. Look at that, tongue flicking in and out Casey. This frame is absolutely oh. perfect. Here we go! Oh! Wow. Oh! That was amazing! That water added an unbelievable effect. Dude, Casey, that might have been the best shot of the day right there. Distinguished by its stocky build and semi-aquatic nature, this New World Pit Viper is an accurately lethal striker. Using heat-sensitive pits, located between the eyes and nostrils, these sensory organs contain a network of thermal receptors that help detect the heat signatures of prey items. Even in complete darkness, the pits allow them to strike with incredible precision. And like a heat-seeking missile, their bite hits and delivers an explosion of hemotoxic venom. To any prey item, this hit is fatal. To humans, it's a race to the hospital. In slow motion, you can truly appreciate how fast and accurate the strike of a snake can be. It's not an experience you want to have, so remember, pay attention to your surroundings when out hiking, and if you come across a venomous snake, always admire it from a safe distance. It is early morning, and it is very similar to the conditions we had the other day when we visited this mechanic's property and unfortunately came across a dead black mamba. We've gotten a call, he has seen another mamba. So we are in fast pursuit to get out to this property as fast as we can so that the snake doesn't either A, kill another dog or get killed itself. Black mambas get a bad reputation as a snake species that will actually chase after you. That is never going to be the case with any animal. They're always gonna choose flight before fight. But most importantly, we need to keep ourselves safe because a bite from one of these animals is a medical emergency. Nothing comes close to the black mamba just due to its size and just the immense speed of these snakes. So yeah, we're going to try to avoid as much as possible having this human mamba conflict, especially with the guys, dogs and cats. So we're going to try to get rid of this mamba and relocate it. So right now Tyrone is just flipping every piece of flat material that he can find anywhere this time of day that would be perfect for snakes to be hiding. Creepy abandoned building. Nest full of wasps. We're gonna keep moving. This is probably a needle in a haystack. Look at this. Especially a snake that's grayish black in color. Talk about crazy camo. If there was a mamba in here. We'll get on in there. Let's find that snake. Well, we've been searching for about 25 minutes now. I've not seen any snakes. I've seen a lot of other things and it's usually when you're looking for a snake that you don't find a snake. They always surprise you. Ooh, that is creepy. Oh, it's like a rodent super highway back there. I don't know if you can see that. We got a snake. A snake? Where? Yeah, we got a snake. Is it a mama? It's a mama. We got a black mama. He's just under this little piece of tile. Snake! Hey, there you snake. What? There you snake. Hey! You got a snake? Is it the mamba? I think it's the mamba, man. Really, really, really? Where? Oh, man, in here? You saw it? Yeah, he's under there. He's a, he looks like a pretty big mamba. It is a mamba. It's definitely a mamba. Shoot, I hope there's no hole back there. I don't see anything. Yes, I do. I see a snake. Definitely see a snake back there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Dude, I think it's a mamba. Inspiration, we coloration. All right, um, mamba madness at its finest right here. That's a mamba. That is definitely a mamba. Tyrone, what is the play? Cool, so we're gonna just move some of the stuff that's sitting on top here. I'm gonna get a tongue on the snake. We're gonna get sort of about 50, 60 centimeters behind the head. And then we're gonna try to get another tongue on the snake just to secure it so the snake starts wriggling around, doesn't put any of us in danger. Okay. Yeah, so we're just gonna safely secure the snake and we're gonna go from there. 
We're just gonna have to be really agile. These snakes are really unpredictable, um, super defensive, so we just gotta be on high alert because this is top tier, the most dangerous snake in the country here. Okay, this is the worst case scenario because it's pinned into a corner. Yeah. The safest scenario for myself, the crew, and certainly the snake is gonna be to get it inside one of these tubes so we have control of the head. All right, I'm, I'm here on your command, so you let me know what you need me to do. Cool, so we're just gonna get on right to it. Now we're gonna move some of this shrapnel out of the way. Yeah, you can see the big coil of the snakes right coming out the back there. We've got a big, big mamba. Oh, man, yeah. Cool, we're going in hot. You want to lift it? Lift yeah, it. Let's lift. Yeah, we got a black mamba. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm going to grab it. Tongs on the snake. You can see he's puffing up his neck there slightly. It's a little narrow hood. One tongue is secure. We're going to grab the secondary part of the snake here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool, the snake is secure. I'm coming out in the open area here. Wow, that's, cool. that is a big snake. Okay, so you want me to get the tubes? Yeah, let's get the tubes, Cody. Okay, uh, what do you think, largest tube? Yeah, let's get with the largest tube. We're just gently restraining the snake. We don't want to put too much pressure on him. Get his head in there. Okay, he's going, he's going. Let him go, let him go a little bit more. I'm gonna, he's gonna reverse. Okay, do you, want, do you want to grab it? Are you comfortable grabbing that? Just put him all the way up there. Let me know as okay. soon as you're comfortable. Yeah, I got a little, I'm not comfortable yet. Yeah, I've still got the tongs on it, they're safe. Okay. And yeah, I, I want you to just put that back hand, so like completely holding the tube and that snake so he's yep. not going to reverse, because he is going to pull back. He is going to pull back, okay. okay just, you don't think he can get out from there? No, as long as you've got a good grip on him. Tell me when you're comfortable, I'm going to release the tongs. Okay, go ahead and release the tongs. This is no rocky moment. Yeah, and I just you remember, he, he, is, he may try reverse, so if he does, just hold him quite in place there. Okay. You got him. Okay. Can I work him up a little bit further? Yeah, you can work him up a little cool. further. <sighs> Good work. Oh, my hands are shaking at the moment. Wow, that is a very strong snake. Um, okay, we'll watch your face there, sorry. There we have it. That is a black mamba, safely tubed. Rather intense situation, but that went pretty smoothly. That's how we do it. We work safely. I catch my breath for a minute. My heart is racing. Okay, so the snake is staying pretty calm now. Um, let's go out of this enclosure and get ourselves in a spot that's a little more open. Uh, if for any reason I have to drop the snake and it comes out of the tube, we're in really close quarters. So uh, let's slowly move out. You guys move first. I'm going to take it really, really slow. I got a really good... Good grip. Tyrone, you want to check my grip on the snake? You think that's Yeah, we're good there. And let's solid. just angle a little bit up, just in okay. case he shoots out. You got okay. it. Yeah, you got a good grip. Yeah, just, you want to sec yeah, secure the tail there? You're good, Code. Yeah. Man, this snake is insanely strong. Whoa! Man, it is intimidating to hold one of these snakes. Right now, just trying to calm my heart rate. There it is, the notorious black mamba. It's almost tough to put into words what it's like to hold on to a black mamba. This is a species that I have just read about for most of my life, always hoping that I would see one in the wild and not actually be hands-on with one, the most dangerous snake species I have ever physically interacted with. It is definitely a heart-racing encounter. Now, the black mamba, of course, gets its name from the black interior coloration of the mouth. And if I turn it like this and it opens up its mouth, we'll be able to get a really cool shot of that. The reason a bite from this snake is so potentially dangerous is because it is armed with a highly toxic, neurotoxic venom. If you're bitten by this snake, it begins to send your body into paralysis, which shuts down your major organs. So when your lungs, uh, your liver, your kidneys, and ultimately your heart begin to cease working, that's why a bite is so dangerous. Essentially, you just straight up go into paralysis and die. If you were ever bitten by a snake like this, it is an immediate medical emergency. The big issue that we're looking at here today is the human-wildlife conflict. And people are terrified of the black mamba. Obviously, it has a negative reputation, but this is not a snake that is interested in interacting with humans. A dog was bitten. Unfortunately, that dog passed away, and the snake was killed in the process. You have that constantly happening out here, especially in rural areas. But these snakes are not to blame. We are in an area that is perfectly set up for snakes to be hunting for their food. You've got abandoned structures. You've got 
have bags of garbage that has everything that would draw in rodents. Where you have rodents, you're going to have the reptiles that eat them. So the more you can do in your own yard to clean up the trash and make sure that you're not drawing in the prey items for these snakes, the less of your chance of actually seeing one of these snakes and ultimately interacting with it. So the last aspect to today's snake rescue is to actually relocate this snake to a place that's far away from human habitation. That will give the better chances for this snake to live out the length of its life, and of course will keep the dogs and the humans in this area completely safe. Now, is this a resident mamba that we were told about? It's possible, it is pretty sizable, but when you live in an area like this, there's always going to be another snake. So you can see why the work that Tyrone does is so incredibly important here in South Africa. And a big thanks to him for taking us out on this rescue mission. I feel completely fulfilled in that we have finally found one of these snakes we were able to rescue. It didn't lose its life, and uh, we're doing a good thing for the environment by getting this predator back out to where it belongs. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Okay, we found a pretty cool spot to release the mamba. We are way back off some dirt road, and we have found a beautiful dry riverbed. It is just perfect mamba habitat. Grasses, trees, likely a lot of food. So uh, we're gonna get the snake out, and this is another success story for Tyrone in successfully rescuing and relocating a venomous snake.